Welcome to Myth versus Craft. Hello, everyone. My guest today is the sensational guitarist and songwriter Philip Sace. Philip cut his teeth playing guitar for the legendary Jeff Healy and later on with Melissa Etheridge. All along, he was set on making his own music, and in 2009, he took the plunge and released his first solo record. Since then, he's built a career on a foundation of deep respect for the artists who influenced him. He's carrying forward their torch and brightening it with his own musical voice. I particularly like his latest two records, Steamroller and Influence, both of which are available on iTunes. Here's our conversation. Marco, it's a real pleasure to chat with you. I appreciate the invitation. Absolutely. I understand that you played piano and trombone before you started playing guitar. Which instrument came first? Definitely the piano. The trombone was something I picked up in school. All the other instruments were already taken. So um, so I ended up with maybe my third or fourth choice. What was your first choice? Oh, I don't know. Probably drums or you know, saxophone or something like that. But usually, uh, you know, everybody runs in and grabs those. So I, uh, I, I thought this is pretty cool. It's slide instrument. Let's I can, I can get down with this for a while and ended up playing it for about 10 years. <laughs> oh, wow. Your uh, parents grew up in the UK in the sixties and you grew up listening to the music that they liked. Did either one of them play any musical instruments? Yeah. So, you know, I think they both played some guitar. I know my mom played a little bit more guitar than, than my dad did, but there was always a, the guitar around the house, but uh, I never really had the nerve to pick it up until, you know, until I was well into my teenage years. But uh, there was always a beautiful soundtrack of, of Roots music uh, in the house, so I'm very thankful for that. Yeah, you read that you were 16 years old when you discovered Stevie Ray Vaughan, and you started playing guitar shortly after, which uh, coincided with his tragic death. How did your daily life change once you started playing guitar? Well, it, you know, became, uh, it became, like, you know, sort of eat, sleep, breathe, everything, guitar. It, uh, you know, came to me at a, you know, very important time in, in my life. You know, when you're in that, right in that mid-teen spot, you're, you know, you find a true love, whether it's a, an individual or, um, or something that you really feel a calling or a passion toward. And uh, that was certainly it. You know, I'd always sort of played music, like I played piano, you know, done some extensive training in, in piano and and as well trombone, but neither were something that I would ever have thought, hey, you know, I want to pursue a career for the rest of my life playing piano or trombone. But the guitar, you know, I was a pretty, uh, I was a pretty ferocious uh, air guitar player before I picked up the guitar. So <laughs> I would run around the house with a tennis racket or whatever. You know, I always wanted to play guitar. And I think it really had a lot to do with the, with the soundtrack, you know, at home, just hearing Clapton and Knopfler and Harrison and Ry Cooter and Billy Guy and Steve Ray Vaughan and Jeff Healy and you know, all this great music. So it just, you know, as soon as I got that fever, so to speak, it just, uh, that's all I could do from the moment I opened my eyes to the minute I went to bed. I figure that at the time, your friends must have been listening to, to grunge music, right? This was the early, mid-90s. Did, it, did that rub off on you at all? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I was a huge fan of these great records, like, you know, the first few Lenny Kravitz records, whether it was Mama Said or... But he wasn't so much of a grunge artist. He was more, you know, I'm not referring to him as a grunge artist, but, you know, that that kind of, it was throwback at that time. And then Pearl Jam 10 was a record that I listened to probably 10 million times. Um, a lot of great guitar playing, obviously directly influenced from some of the players we were just talking about. So on the rock end of things, that was what a lot of my friends were, were listening to. That was happening, you know, if you went to a party and people were playing a guitar, they'd sure enough be playing Even Flow or, or Alive. And so... You know, you just kind of jump in and uh, and try and jam along with it. So they were ruling the world at that time. So it was a, a really quite an exciting time for me to start getting my feet wet. But my my heart was really around going to see people like you know Buddy Guy and Albert Collins, and you know that was really where where I was at. But I certainly uh, enjoyed a lot of a lot of the bands we just mentioned as well. Learned a lot and really enjoyed the energy in that music. I understand that you were going to blues jams in, in Toronto. Did you, did you have any long-term bands or, or projects at the time, or were you primarily just, just trying to participate in these blues jams and, and trying to really soak up that kind of music? I, I was always approaching it like a sponge. You know, I was just so elated to go into a club, 
five or five years underage or whatever it was, you know, and just sort of sneak in and watch these these guys in Toronto. There's a club called Grossman's, and uh, you know, every city's got their sort of roots music hub. You know, for instance, like an in Antones in Austin or something. You know, very well known in Toronto. There's a club. It's called Grossman's. And it's been there since maybe the 60s or 70s, but uh, that was where all the you know the serious players would go down and and light it up. And so I was in high school playing in a band called. Nikki B and the Jammers. And uh, I was maybe 17, maybe. So at night, I'd be in the clubs playing with Nick and his band. And these were guys that were, you know, 20s, 30s, 40s, I don't know how old they were, but they were they were grown men. And so I was getting a chance to go out and play in these clubs and sort of learn. And he really gave me an opportunity to, to jump into the pool. And all those guys told me, man, you got to you gotta go to Grossman's. You just got to check it out. So I remember one of the first nights I went there, there was a guy named Mike McDonald playing who, you know, if you're from Toronto or that area, you know, you know about him. He's, he's really serious. He's a beautiful command of the instrument. You know, he had a guy playing with him that night named Michael Keith, who as well is from Toronto and just an absolutely extraordinary player. And every time I went down there, maybe next time it was Pat Rush or Danny Marks or Bruce Dominey or these players from that area that... I would say would hold their own in any city anywhere in the world. These are serious, serious cats. So I just went down and tried to maybe take something home with me. And I said, I'd rush home and then say, how do you do that? How do you? And maybe I'd figure out one thing and just constantly try to keep my eyes and ears open. You'd been playing guitar for maybe three years when I believe Jeff Healy came to one of your shows. And uh, sometime later you were introduced to each other and eventually he asked you to join his band. It's pretty incredible that you managed to impress Jeff Healy after playing for only, what, three years? Would you say that you progressed at a, at a much faster rate than your peers? You know, I, I don't know if I can comment on the sort of the rate of progression, you know, compared to anyone else, because there, there were friends in high school that were great players, and so I was learning from them, and just, you know, I was spending as much time as I could with, with you know, records of all my heroes, like, you know, watching Stevie Ray Vaughan and Double Trouble Live at Dale Combo four billion times, or, or you know, or... You know, going to see Coco Montoya tear it up with, uh, you know, John Mayall at the time or, you know, and just just really trying to immerse myself in it. So I think it, it just it wasn't even so much of a cerebral thing. It was more of like a it was just I just kept putting one foot in front of the other and just spent as much time as I could practicing. And I think perhaps having a, a long, you know, 10 year opportunity to learn sort of about tone and and pitch and sort of the, a, a basic understanding of music through, you know, learning how to play piano for a long time and as well as trombone. And I think that maybe helped my ear a little bit, you know, having a bit of a background, but I just went, I just went for it. You know, I didn't think about what was right or what was wrong. And so, yeah, maybe it was three, four five years, somewhere in that window. I just, I just put my heart on my sleeve and went for it. And then when I stood next to playing next to somebody like Jeff, it was kind of like, Oh shit. It's time to get back to the drive. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's when those five years became real obvious. <laughs> so, you know, it, it was like time to get, you know, time to get back into the, into the gym, so to speak, and uh, keep, keep working at it, which is, you know, what, I, what I'm doing every day of my life. It sounds like you couldn't have hoped for a better mentor than, than Jeff, besides being generous and supportive. I understand that from day one, he was really kind of grooming you to eventually go out on your own. Yeah, it, w it was extraordinary, you know, and, and I, you know, I look up and say, thank you, God, for every, every, uh, every day for the opportunity. You know, Jeff was, this was kind of a funny little thing. I don't really tell people about this, but in elementary school, you know, I had a, we had to do some kind of a, this is going to sound very spinal tap, but we had to do like a puppet show. Okay. In elementary school, we had to like make a puppet out of paper mache or something, and then put on a show. And I remember, I haven't thought of this till, since I was, maybe in elementary school. <laughs> and I remember, um, oh, I remember, you know, I made these two marionettes or something out of paper mache and then had this whole, I concocted a stage and I had these two guys that were sort of like jamming. And one song was Jeff Healy's See the Light. And the other side was like, I think it was a combination of some live Eric Clapton and some other stuff, throwing solos back and forth. And so when I think about it, you know, Jeff... <laughs> You know, his music freaked me out the first time I heard it. I didn't play guitar. I didn't know that, you know, anything about him. I just heard it on the radio and it kind of grabbed me from the inside. And to have the opportunity to to really watch and learn from him at such a close, 
was such a close respect, you know, I'm deeply, deeply grateful. He was, you know, there's a lot of great players, right? Like everywhere you go on YouTube, everybody is good. Everyone can play. And, but then there's guys like that that are just kind of throwing gravity and shades of colors and things are coming out of them. And it was, oof, it was really, really impossible to put into words what it felt like what was coming through him. He was a very, very special man. I can't imagine what, what it would have been like to share a stage with him. Do you recall the moment when you felt like you were ready to, to leave his band? And I think it was shortly after that. You left to move to L.A., right? That's correct. Thanks for asking. You know, I, I do remember. So I've been touring with Jeff. I spent almost four years with him. You know, we had come to a place where I'd been working with him. Uh, we'd been touring and, you know, starting to, to get some, some uh, opportunities for my own music. And, uh, you know, he just, he said to me one day, you know, Philip, at a certain point, it, it's a good time, you know, for you to spread your wings and jump out of the nest, you know, and he wasn't encouraging me to, to leave, but he was, he was, again, it was part of that, that initial sort of invitation to spend time with him and learn how to play on big stages and, you know, just, just learn. And then he sort of said, Hey man, I think that was his kind of way of saying, look, you know, you might be ready to jump out of the nest, young bird. <laughs> so, uh. You know, he was he was very beautiful and, and giving in that way. And so, you know, get some offers from different companies to collaborate and do some recordings. And so it just made sense to uh, start spending more time in California. You uh, eventually met uh, uh, Melissa Etheridge and joined her band for three years. It sounds like she was also an excellent mentor and, and she was supportive when you decided to go out on your own. When you left, I'm sure you felt ready from a musical standpoint. Did you feel prepared from a business standpoint? So I'm so glad that you highlighted highlighted that. And, you know, we'll, maybe we'll chat about Melissa here in a second. I only have amazing things to say about her in, in her own way. You know, just a, a true force of nature and a, just a ridiculous talent. I mean, she is, whew, man, she can, she'll, she'll bring you to your knees. She's amazing. Mm -hmm. And, I, yeah, I learned a lot from her, and I'm very thankful for that opportunity as well. But, you know, you raise a really, really important point, which is the business end of things. Somebody said this to me a long time ago, and I really... A really, <laughs> it really connected. It is the music business, not the music friendship. My interest, my enthusiasm, my uh, sort of feelings of, of inspiration do not come from the business end of things. And I think, you know, this business, if you are not prepared, will eat you up. And um, we've seen it happen to many, many people. And it's harsh. It's a harsh business. And so I think one thing that's really important for, for anybody who's getting into entertainment business, music business, is to understand that while your chops and your musicality, your, your musicianship is certainly the number one ingredient if you're going to spend your life being a musician, it's very, very important to surround yourself with people that you can trust. And whether that's a family member or whether that's a lawyer who, or whether that's a, a manager, but again, you know, you have to be very, very careful. A lot of unscrupulous characters, and they come in all shapes and sizes. And uh, any crack or opening of light, they will, <laughs> they'll get in there. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it can, it can hurt. So I think it's really important to, to get your kind of business chops together as well. You know, while you're staring at Jimi Hendrix videos and and Steve Ray Vaughan videos and Van Halen or whoever it is that turns you on, maybe every once in a while, I think it's important to pick up a, a book about the business because uh, those sharks are hungry. <laughs> Did you know all of this back then? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. It's just been, uh, it's one of those things, you know, you, uh, you get burnt by the fire the first time, you know, it's like, oh, cool, you're a kid, what's that? You touch the flame. No, nope, you're not supposed to touch that. So I think it's, you learn. But again, it's, it's these things come up and, and uh, individuals can come up in all shapes and sizes. But I think really, you know, the, the focus is about trying to, uh, to, to protect the art, to, to protect the creativity and the musicianship and the, the care for where this music has come from and to care about where, for me, at least anyway, in my life, where I can carry it to and, and hopefully bring it forward and continue positive energy in the world. You know, just do it in my own way. It's for my own lens. I want to come back to, to the music industry a bit later in our conversation, but I'd like to talk about your music for a moment. As far back as I've heard, you've always played with great passion and intensity, and that's really evident in any video or, or recording I've, I've heard of you. Over time, I get, I get the sense that this intensity has gotten more focused 
for, for lack of a better description, I hear more nuance in your phrasing and your dynamics. How would you say that your guitar playing has evolved over the past, say, 10 years? Wow, well, thank you for asking about that. And, you know, from my perspective, if the playing is evolving, it has a lot to do, well, certainly, you know, with just the, the, you know, you practice or you go out and you play tours and you play, you know, hours and hours and hours a day in, in different kinds of environments, different situations. You know, you're constantly, for me, I'm constantly learning. I'm constantly striving to get better. So that hunger has never changed. That intention to continue developing as a musician has never changed. But for me, it's directly connected to who I am as a person and the growth that, that I'm doing in this world as, a, as an individual and as a human being. And so what I really hope is that any kind of growth that is seen through the music or through the, you know, through that channel is directly a result of the work that I'm doing on myself as a, as a human being in this world and what I'm learning and how I'm doing the best that I can to evolve as a person. That's a good segue to the topic of artistic evolution. Um, Matt Schofield was on the show a few weeks ago, and we talked about the challenges of evolving as a musician who plays blues-centered music, in that there's fairly well-established bounds for this type of music, at least for purists. So it can be tough to grow within these perceived constraints. How do you aspire to grow as an artist? Where, where are you looking to go? What are you looking to achieve? You know, in, in some ways, and that's a great question, I think Matt is a tremendous musician. He's a just superb, superb artist. You know, I do think that, you know, where, well, again, it's one foot in front of the other. I don't necessarily, from my perspective, where I am today in January 2016, I don't know if, I, if I'm fully aware of what my perspective will be in January 2020. The more that I can do to evolve, and just to touch back on what I was just mentioning, the more that I can do to to evolve as a human being and to be a better person in the world and to perhaps be, be in more connection, a better, deeper, clearer connection with what my intention is from, from the root, from the initial inspiration, which is to continue the energy of the music that turned me on from day one. If, if I can continue moving in that direction for all of my days, you know, that, that's really what my intention is. I've never been someone that really gets turned on by boxes and putting music in a certain box or it has to be, this is folk or this is jazz or this is, it is what it is. You know, to me, it's more about the feeling and the color of it. And whatever music I'm making is certainly my first love and connections to roots music. And that, you know, probably in the forefront of that or certainly in the forefront is blues music, um, soul music, funk, but there's all kinds of different shades and all kinds of different colors. It's almost like flying, you know, um, if you're in the right in the right space, you know, well, why would you want to have to fly the same pattern every time? You know, you could go and do some turns and some twists and let's go this way. And that, uh, that's, I think, what also really turns me on about the, the sort of improv nature of the music that I do my best to make. You released your first album, Peace Machine, uh, about seven years ago. I think it was 2009. When do you first start writing your own material? So, you know, I've always been writing my own material and just, you know, some of it's just been, whether it's a, a, a riff or if it's a, a full song, you know, some of it's gotten used, some of it hasn't. But I've always, you know, had my eye on what, what it is that I've wanted to do. Something that I've experienced, certainly from more of the business end of things, which is, which is difficult, is a lot of times people uh, in the industry will say, well, that's really cool, but you know, we need it to sound, we need you to sound like this band or that band. So can you just, you know, all that stuff you're doing, can you just not do so much of that? And we'll give you a song and we'll hook you up with the producer and writer of the month and, and, uh, you know, just make it sound exactly like this other band. Can you do that? You know, that gets, it gets a little tiring after a while. Um, I understand why, you know, because the motivation is, is, uh, first and foremost financial. So I think it's about finding a middle ground in terms of the songwriting sometimes. Peace Machine was a project that was, you know, fully free to do what whatever I wanted to do with it. There was nobody telling me, oh, you got to sound like another act, or can you make your music more generic, or can you just stand there and not play guitar and, you know, make it look cool. So the Peace Machine thing was really just, you know, I was working with Melissa. Uh, she was going to be taking some time off for some health reasons, and so I called the touring band, at the, you know, the guys who I really bonded with, which was Kenny Arnoff on drums and Mark Brown 
on bass and just say, guys, I got some songs. Can we go in and just record them? And, and my friend Fred Mandel, an extraordinary musician in his own right, he came and played on it as well. And we just kind of went in and had fun. And we recorded it really quickly. And uh, so that's really what the Peace Machine thing was all about. It was just songs that I'd either just written and some I'd written way before. Has songwriting gotten any easier over time, or is it just as tough, just as challenging as it's always been? You know, I think both are true. Um, and I'm sure you've heard this from anybody you've chatted with. You know, there there is a paint-by-numbers approach. You know, uh, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, breakdown, chorus, and we finish the song. You know, and that's cool. Like, that can that can be an exercise in uh, how, to, how to make something that sounds like everything else, which is fine. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. So And sometimes something like that is, if someone's looking for a song like that, they've laid the sort of boundaries, if you will, for the kind of song that, that you're going to be able to, to move forward with. I think when it's something that is fully creative and there's nobody, you know, suggesting that you need to sound like whatever band was popular that month, that's when it becomes really fun because it's kind of like a blank canvas and you have a palette of as many colors as you can sort of think of. And on that particular day, you can just color and paint and do whatever you want. And maybe you don't need to play that song for anybody ever. It's just a, it's just an opportunity to be expressive. It's like a diary, if you will. So some things can be a real challenge. You know, sometimes it's like, man, I just can't get this right. And other times, the less you think about it, the more you get. Do you write a ton of songs and only keep the best? Or do you discard a song and as soon as you feel that it doesn't have much potential? Sometimes if, if I'm, if I'm working on a song um, or putting something together and it doesn't quite seem like it's all coming into, you know, like it's just sort of a little lopsided or something. Man, I don't know what's up with this one. It's kind of cool, but I can't, you know, it's like if you were making a, if you were making a curry, you know, and some days you make like the world's most amazing curry. And then other times you're like, I don't know, huh? this one is good. It's a little bit weird, this one, you know, like, but I, I try not to discard things. I'll, like, is that piece of that song may become, you know, a really important section of another song. So what I'll do is I'll sort of keep things. I'll keep it for a rainy day, or maybe this is the, maybe this will be the missing link in another song. Are you pretty disciplined about cataloging your material? Well, how do you define discipline? <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I don't know how many saved uh, little recordings I have on my iPhone here. Probably, probably I don't know. I, I don't even know how I would go back in now and find them. Because sometimes, you know, you're just, you're, you're driving and you're walking down the street and you have a melody come in your head and you just put it in the phone and, and hopefully come back through to it one day. And so in that way, that's the, really the, the discipline that I have is just putting stuff into, into the iPhone with the hopes that one day I'll come back and find it. <laughs> Do you have a set process for songwriting, or does it happen in, in a variety of ways? It does happen in a variety of ways, but most of the time, even if I'm co-writing with someone, usually it starts with the music part, uh, the music first, so I'll get kind of a vibe or a rhythm happening with the guitar, even a riff maybe, and think, oh man, that could be cool, and just try to keep playing that, try to keep jamming on it. I don't need to write the whole song in, in the moment. So just try to play on it, get a groove, get a vibe. And if other, you know, if other sections of the song start coming in, well, then wonderful. Then I'll just start, you know, start putting them down. If they're not coming right away and there's just this really great first idea, then I'll roll with that for a while. And maybe two weeks later, another another riff idea will come in or something. And then I'll sew them together and start putting a, a melody together. And then some, some of the songwriters I've worked with, they're, they're really interesting you know, you'll have your sort of chord structure, the idea of where the song's going, and you start kind of humming a, a melody and sort of making up gibberish words. And sometimes those gibberish words can actually be pretty darn close to what ends up in the final version of the song. That's a, another great segue. I was going to ask you about lyrics and whether writing them comes easy or, or if it's a struggle. Yeah, I think, again, both are true. You know, in some cases, it can be uh, very, very easy and very open and just come right through. Other times, you know, it can feel like, yeah, this one's not sitting quite right, or man, it's a little, that's pretty trite. Or, you know, oh, man, that's, that line's been used six million times. And sometimes it's easier for people to, to get into something if it's like, oh, wait, that kind of reminds me of something, you know, so you can't, 
can't worry about it too much because at the end of the day, it's all been done. You know, I, I, I like some kind of like out there lyrics a little bit. I really like, for instance, like T-Rex, kind of out there psychedelic lyrics a lot of times. If you try to take little little flavors from with, with that sort of a, with that sort of an approach, if you will, a little bit of like a trippy psychedelic vibe, just because I enjoy that. That's just what I like naturally. Uh, and then sometimes I'll try to put a little bit of a story in there, being careful to not get too heavy. So uh, like on, on a new record, there's a song called Evil Woman. And it's, there's 11 songs, I'm sure, or 11,000 songs called Evil Woman. But I wrote it with, with Dave Cobb. And for me, the song is not about a woman at all. It's actually about a man, but it just sang well, Evil Woman, you know? I've asked many of my guests how they avoid repetition or if they try to avoid repeating themselves. And I've had a wide range of responses, ranging from Ian Moore telling me that that's never been a problem. And if anything, he, he has to he has to make an effort to try to find some kind of thread that ties his music together, but repeating himself hasn't been an issue. And uh, Mike Campbell from The Heartbreakers told me that he just goes with the flow and he never try even if something appears to be reminding him of something he uh, it shuts down his muse to to think too hard about that at that point and he usually goes through with the effort and completes it and perhaps late at a later time might realize that yeah it's too similar to something else and he can't use it but he just kind of goes with the flow and it never stops during the process how do you handle this? Do you ever uh, purposely go into something trying to avoid repeating yourself or or in the middle of, of the process realize that it might remind you of something and discard it? I actually think that I'm probably closer, as much as I actually uh, admire both those artists, Ian Moore is a huge influence on me, and uh, of course, my Campbell as well, and I feel like probably closer to my Campbell school of things. You know, I... It's a little bit of a slippery slope. You know, if I start overthinking things in music, that's not really always the best route for me. Because again, you know, you write a song one day, it doesn't mean you have to do anything with it. I think it's, it's like that was the expression on that particular day or a collection of days, however long it takes to put a piece together. You don't know where that's going to lead you. And you might be playing something and be like, oh man, this is fun. Wait a minute, this is almost Freedom by Jimi Hendrix. This is really, really close, you know? Um... Oh, so, you know, you keep that in mind. And what I usually tell myself at that point is, listen, I can write another riff. You know, I can, it's okay. I can write another riff, but let's keep moving forward. Let's get this done. And then at the end, if I want to circle back and look at it, and it feels like something is a little too, you know, unintentionally close to something else, then, yeah, I'll address it at that time. But I like the idea of just keeping the, keeping the root open, you know, and not get into my own head. Just stay out of my head and, and, you know, get out of my head and stay in my heart, so to speak, or however the saying goes. <laughs> I read a quote from you in which you said, uh, quote, singing is all about conviction and courage, uh, about confidence and projection. I figured that much of that courage and confidence can come from practice and repetition, but much of it is, is either part of one's DNA or earned over time from just living one's life. If you had to chart your confidence level throughout your musical career, would you be able to clearly identify any major highs or lows, or has it been pretty even all along? Wow, that's a great question. You know, I think for anybody who is, uh, you know, putting their art out there or wears their heart on their sleeve, I think that there's, uh, look, I can't speak for anybody else, you know, but I think that there's, a, for me, there's certainly uh, an intention in the music. You know, I don't know if I can speak to confidence per se, as opposed to a, a connection. And when I feel, a, when I feel a connection, maybe that includes confidence, but it also includes clarity. It includes peace. It includes, uh, empowerment. Uh, it includes excitement. It's, it's ups and downs, you know, and I think that touches on, on the business piece. You know, sometimes when people don't treat you right in the business, your heart becomes the the, uh, the doormat and that can become that's the really the thing that can start to change the flavor and the excitement around around why I do this in the first place you know I think it, it impacts me as an individual which then starts to impact the entire package so to speak I want to uh, pay you a compliment that's not directly related to music and that is that you have uh, great soft skills meaning you write well, you're articulate, you're courteous, uh, appreciative. Would you say that these qualities have had much of an impact on your career? I'd like to think that they've helped. Well, thank you, first and foremost. <laughs> Maybe that's just sort of being a, 
a product of being raised in Canada. Maybe it's my parents. Maybe it's my wife, Kelly. I don't know. But that's how I try to talk to anybody who's in my life. You know, but, uh, some, everybody has their days where maybe they're a little bit more curt or, uh, you know, a little, a little edgy. But uh, for the most part, I do the best that I can to speak to others as I would want to be spoken to. Another way to phrase the question is, you, you seem like a really nice guy and considerate. Do you think that matters much in your industry? You know, I, I think a lot of people mistake kindness for weakness. And on more than on more than 25 occasions, I've had to remind people of, of that very thing. Uh, and that's never, never fun. But it's something that, in my experience, is definitely lacking in the industry is, is a courteousness, consideration. It's not just across the board. You know, I can't generalize like that. I think it's more about it's a journey of, of for me, I can't speak for anybody else, but trying to find, so to speak, my people. You know, just as you would be trying to find your people, people that are in alignment with sort of the way that I act in the world or the way that I try to talk to other people or do the best that I can to be kind and don't see that as an opening or an opportunity to take advantage. And most of the time, people will show you their colors pretty quickly. You know, if you let your guard down with someone and you figure out who they are, I think it's on the other side of it. For me, where I've learned that if somebody shows you their colors, it's time to move on quickly. So it's just like, you know what? Thank you so much. We are clearly not on the same page here. Goodbye. But I think in the music business, there's so much fear. There's so much competition, but a lot of fear-based type energy. And I think that that's very challenging when a lot of people are chasing the dollar or what they perceive as the dollar, or they want, they want something somebody else has. And so they have to do whatever it takes to get there. And I, so I can't say that I, think about it too much that it's like an act or something I'm putting on. It's just kind of, it's just kind of how I roll with my friends or anybody I talk to. And again, if it gets shady or weird, the best thing that I can do is to just kind of to say, okay, all the best to you. Thanks so much. See you. Let's go back to the music industry for a moment. When uh, Ian Moore was on the show, he commented on how he has to spend so much of his time marketing himself and his music. I see his point, but the optimist in me thinks that when you do your own marketing, you at least get to own the message. Uh, you decide how the money is spent uh, and potentially form a closer connection to your audience. You uh, are active on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, do you feel like nowadays social media is just a mandatory part of your job? I would say, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's just, it's just part of it. You know, I think marketing now, I mean, the, the industry shifted so much. It's about awareness. And there's such a high consumption rate, you know, things are being consumed at, uh, you know, it's like, well, what have you done for me lately type of idea? You know, you may have just recorded, you know, an EP and you put it out. Well, then six weeks later, people are like, well, what else you got? Man, I just spent half a year working on this. So I think it's, in some ways, it's, it's kind of exciting Instagram. You know, you're in your house, you're practicing, you just put the phone up or, or Periscope or whatever. And so you can keep this sort of ongoing connection, if you will even if it's not necessarily a personal one-on-one -on -one connection all the time, there's, there's an opportunity to, uh, to still use that word connect with people who are interested and who are, you know, they're just, you know, people are just, they're just going through. They just need the next tweet. I'm grateful if anybody even takes the time to sit down and listen or send a message, you know, via whatever social media platform. And like I said, you know, I don't always have an opportunity to, to respond or, or sometimes, you know, check it, everything on a daily basis, but, I'm grateful. If somebody wants to wants to reach out and say, "Hey, man, I really dig what you're doing. Keep it up." Cheers. Thank you so much. <laughs> so I think it's just about trying to keep a presence happening, staying people's awareness because there's there's a billion and one choices at every moment, and uh, so you just gotta you just gotta keep keep making some noise, so to speak. Steve Albini, the producer, gave a speech a couple of years ago in which he uh, argued that the internet actually made things incredibly better for musicians uh, because it made it so much easier to uh, record your music, to find an audience, to connect with that audience, to collaborate with other musicians, and to charge more money for live shows. The idea being that you find an audience and then connect with them at a deeper level, and then they're more willing and eager to go watch you perform. I contrast this perspective with anecdotal evidence, just stories from musicians I know here in Austin and, and the difficulties of trying to make a living uh, primarily you know, uh, playing live. 
And I contrast it with an experience that you described in an interview. I think it was right around the time, same time that he gave the speech a couple of years ago. In the interview, you described the chicken or egg conundrum of trying to book shows only to have an agent ask who your label is and then have the label ask who your agent is. And at, long story short, I, I wanted to ask you, do you think that having a label behind you is still a big net positive in today's environment? Man, compliments to you on so many levels. But uh, yeah, this is a great conversation. Thank you. <laughs> I, I really, Marco, you know, I really feel like this is, this is going to be interesting here. I really feel like you can get it done on your own um, without the help of a label. At the same time, I think that there are opportunities that working with a larger company can afford an artist that are, you know, just it's a lot easier to get through certain doors. A lot different. It's a very, very, very different thing. Still, even in this day and age, you know, what we see happen all the time is something goes viral, whatever that means now, you know, or something gets, people get very, very excited about something online. It's a, you know, a 12 year old, you know, let's say playing, well, whatever, they get 6 million hits in a day or something. The record label is going to go and sign them because that means that, you know, oh, well, they got a buzz, you know. I kind of feel like my experience of working with with record labels, even in, in currently, it depends on the individuals at the label. It depends on the label. They're all different. Um, again, I, I touched on something a while ago about this kind of fear-based energy, you know, coming strictly from uh, a financial perspective only, which is fine. I mean, to, to each their own, right? I mean, it doesn't mean that something's less than because they're strictly and only motivated by money. I think it's just about identifying that up front. And if you're an artist that, you know, wants the freedom to be able to do what you want, you know, it may not make sense to partner up with a specific label because they're, they don't care about your artistic vision. Even if they say they do, it comes down to, it comes down to dollars at the end of the day. I think you can make great strides on your own and you do not necessarily have to be with a label. Uh, but there are things that are, that are helpful. Uh, promotional campaigns, which make people aware of, uh, I mean, yeah, you can do that through social media platform and you can tweet till you're blue in the face and all of that. But sometimes there are companies that are just, you know, they've got that many more connections and they can put you in front of that many more people. And we see that happen all the time. You know, why have I not heard of this act? Why do I hear about this act 24 seven? If I can share something about my, my current relationship with, with Warner, you know, this came about because of where we are with the way music is consumed. Now, an incredible gentleman there is his, his name, is Steve Waxman. He's been at Warner if there for 20 plus years. And he was listening to Spotify, somebody's playlist and a song came on and he was like, Oh dude, that's cool. Okay. I don't know who that is, but I'm going to send him a note. And so he heard a song that I recorded and really liked it and just said, you know, I, I don't know who you are, but when, when you come in through town. So we just connected and I said, Hey, I just finished a record. You should hear it. And we just kind of hit it off and he, you know, it became a very super organic way to connect with someone at a major label. And they have really given me an opportunity to make the music that I want to make and extremely just very, very supportive and respectful of what it is that I want to say or what I'm feeling um, and want to put across. And so in that way, that's the most unique experience that I've come across of any record label in my entire life versus, let's say, working with another company that may have said, well, doesn't, doesn't your producer know how to make a record? Like, what is this shit? Mm. And then he gets nominated for two Grammys that year. It's that, you know, it's just this different mentality where some people are, yeah, it's, it, I think it's, again, it, it has to go to sort of a case by case basis, but long story short, yes, you can get it done on your own. <laughs> That's a little, little a roundabout way of getting there, but I'm extremely grateful, you know, for the team that I have around me at this time um, and that they are understanding and supportive of the music that I love and want to share. That's a that's a great story. I uh, I think of I think of the dichotomy of like the, the the good and the bad of YouTube, of Spotify, of all these different channels to to find music, and basically how easy it is as a, a for the audience or for anyone really to find music. And I think of you know that's how I found you. That's how I heard of you and so many other artists that that I like. It was YouTube, 
And that's wonderful, yet at the same time, it means that there's just this flood of content where, yes, it's a lot easier to take a sip from that fire hose, but it's still a fire hose. So I, I, don't, I don't know quite how I feel about it. I love that perspective. It is very much like a fire hose, yeah. And, and I think that you know, what comes to mind for me is that's where you know, a lot of, you know, let's, let's say a company, whether it's an independent record label or, or a major record label, whatever, somebody who is paying for ad, you know, for ad space or is paying for an artist's video to pop up. So let's say you go and check out a Warren Haynes video and somebody else's video pops up alongside. Well, a lot of times there's a reason that happens because somebody is paid for that. So I think, or there's, you know, there's other ways that things happen that we're not all aware of out here <laughs> that happen in, in, you know, in the business room or, or in the, the way that this music reaches us. And I think that sometimes that happens when you have a larger partner or you have somebody that's working on that all the time. I'm not a professional, uh, you know, I'm not a publicist or, or a marketing person. I just do the best that I can. Some people who are in the industry, they got, they know the tricks. I've uh, had a couple of guests comment on the importance of being true to oneself, and and you're the third guest to to specifically address that. Um, but the importance of being true to oneself, especially when presented with opportunities to do the exact opposite, in the hopes of of maybe becoming more successful. And uh, an example that comes to mind was David Grissom talking about passing on on a cushy gig uh, with Rod Stewart to instead uh, form Storyville, come back to Austin and form that band. And how his perspective was that he thinks that in the end it all evens out. So you might as well follow your own path. And I read that you had a manager early on who, and, and you touched on this earlier, you alluded to it. You had a manager early on who tried to get you to play less guitar and write more pop songs. Does this type of offer or that type of attitude still come along even now at this stage in your career? Yeah, it's unbelievable to me. I don't know. Like, you know, listen, I'm a student of music, okay? I'm a student of life. Like, you know, I, I hear music. It makes me want to go and practice or go do a gig and learn and try to keep getting better. When people come to a show, I don't even have to be talking about myself, but if you go to a show and you see a, a group of guys or gals or whoever is on stage, you see that they're soaked head to toe by the end of that show and they're carrying amps in and out and they're trying to say hello to people and They've got a good house. Let's say the show's sold out or there's, you know, a full club or whatever. And you know, get the guy that will come up and say, I'm so-and-so with this company and blah, blah, blah. You know, if you just made it sound just, you know, we just take this and change what you do. Wow. Oh, you can be a star and we'll get you out of this dump and we'll take, you know, and you kind of got to look at someone and say, like, you didn't see what just happened here. Like you're, and again, that goes back to being, working with people who are in alignment with what your intentions are, what you're putting out. So people are just not, you know, they're, they're caught up in their own thing. And, and that's fine. I mean, it doesn't make it better or worse. I think it's just about identifying in these relationships. Does this person get what it is that I'm trying to do? And ultimately, do I get what they're trying to do? So I think identifying that early on. But yeah, I mean, all the time people come up and say, I shouldn't say all the time, you know, take it for granted. But, you know, people say, look, man, we'd love to do something with you. We work the stars. Can you just make your music more generic? And I don't know, you want to grow a beard? Like everybody's got a beard. Uh, maybe we can like style it that way. And if you don't do that, they give you this feeling of like, well, have fun in your club. Have fun out there. No one will ever hear of you. And I've had people say that. It's very painful, very painful. It's like somebody dangling a carrot off the edge of a cliff and saying, Could just jump, just jump. And I, so I agree with what somebody like an incredible, incredible artist like David Grissom is saying. Like, it's really hard to say no, but sometimes it's important to say no to make room for the greater yes. You know, you could go out and make 10,000 bucks a week if that still exists anywhere, but, you know, with a really high pain, high profile band. But if you're miserable, then what's that all about? You know, I mean, you have to pay your rent. You need money to survive. I get it. And it's not always easy to make a living. So. There's, a, there's definitely a balance and sort of an internal dialogue that one would have to have with themselves if presented with that. But for my own journey, it's really painful, man. When you put your heart, you spill it out, and you just, you know, you chat with people if they were kind enough to stay to the end of the show and say, man, I really appreciate what you did tonight. And then somebody who apparently has the keys to the kingdom, so to speak, says to you, yeah, that was, that was cool, man, but we need you to go and work with this guy that 
that just wrote this pop song and that thing and blah, blah, blah. And, and it's not that I'm against that. I have no problem with it. But if it, I think you know what I'm saying. Yeah, for sure. And uh, one, um, call it an anomaly or, or an interesting case study for me is uh, Joe Bonamassa and the success that he has had. And I've, I've read a handful of interviews with him and, and Kevin Shirley, who um, produces uh, most, if not all, of his records now. And and read about how this must have been, I don't know, 10, maybe maybe longer, 10, 15 years ago, that Joe Bonamassa had, you know, he started playing super young and he had built somewhat of a following, but was still, you know, playing some of the smaller clubs. And Kevin Shirley came up and made a version of that pitch to him, which they were by no means, I'm not implying that they were asking him to change who he was or his type of music, but if he made certain adjustments, if he made a certain number of tweaks and they were willing to trust these these gentlemen to make those tweaks that he could he could take his his career to the next level and I think he's a fascinating case study in that it it worked tremendously well for him I, I just find that really interesting because it seemed to have worked for him but most of the time my gut is that those pitches are typically much greasier and closer to what you just described a few moments ago yeah I think so and, and I think you raise a good point you know I think there's a lot uh, well, you know, and look, Joe's success is, of course, very, very well deserved. He's, you know, is just an extraordinary musician, and and it's incredibly hard worker. Oh yeah, no, no, we're on the same page there for sure. You know, I only admire what Joe is doing, and I think it certainly creates a lot of inspiration for a lot of people to continue doing what they do. You know, um, and what I was going to say is, you know, I think a lot of times when these pitches are made, it can be very abrasive. And it, a lot of times, in, in, in my experience, it hasn't had a lot to do with what I'm currently doing. So when someone comes and says, you know, just kind of stand there and do an image thing and don't play so much guitar, it's kind of like, well, uh, I don't really see how that, what that has to do with something. If somebody comes and says, look, we dig what you're doing. What if we kind of came in this? You know, I think, as you were describing maybe with Joe's, maybe it wasn't that far of a leap away from what he was already doing. It was maybe a refinement. A lot of times I feel like I've sort of experienced, for me personally, the, the experience is always, I'm very grateful that someone even take the time to chat about it. And there are other times where people have come to me and said, look, we want to change something or you should try this producer and try something and I'll, and I'll try something different and it will work out incredibly well. So it's not that I'm against the idea of trying new things and breaking new ground and making new friends. I love all of that. I think it's just when something is rooted strictly in coming from a place of fear. We need you to be the next king. We need you to sound exactly like Kings of Leon, okay? I, I like Kings of Leon. They're, they're great. Why do we need a bad Kings of Leon? Like, I, I, that's all it would be. You know? <laughs> so I think maybe finding the right hybrid there where it feels, you know, respectful of, of, of what I'm trying to do, but as well, you know, it's, it's always good to make new friends and try new things. Don't get me wrong. Knowing what you know now and, and having gone through the experiences, uh, highs and lows that, that you've gone through, have you found that you've had to recalibrate your aspirations or what you, what you think you, you want in, in your musical career? Or has it been a, a true north all along and it hasn't really wavered? What I'm trying to do is, you know, certainly I want to limit my experience in my life to what I want it to look, what I think it should look like. Because it could look it could look exponentially more beautiful than anything I could ever dream up or imagine, you know, and sometimes it's, it's hard to enjoy the journey when you're really grinding it out. You know, like if you're, you know, if you're a hockey player and you're setting up the most unbelievable plays and you keep hitting the goalpost or you, you know, or you, you know, it's after a while, yeah, you can get frustrated. You know, I was a Wayne Gretzky said, you know, hundred percent of the shots that you don't take don't go in. So mm -hmm. I think it's really about, it's really about just trying to summon up the energy and the courage and the, even in your darkest days, you know, you're feeling down just to, to get back in touch with what that initial spark and love, that inspiration was in the first place. The authenticity has to be the main ingredient, has to be at the root of whatever it is. Philip, what, uh, what projects are you, uh, are you working on? What should we look out for coming from you? Well, first and foremost, I'm, I'm working on this record. It's called Influence which was produced by Dave Cobb. Um, and then when Warner came on board, we had an opportunity to add a couple of other songs that I had been working on uh, with Michael Nielsen, the producer. Uh, I worked on with him on Peace Machine. So we're sort of in the middle of still promoting that record, which I'm you know, really grateful, really grateful for. 
uh, and really excited to be doing. Um, there's a live record that I've sort of been working on, I guess, for off and on for the last, I don't know, 18 months or so at least. I'm trying to mix in some of those things and going to try and figure out when and where would make sense to make that music available. And then ultimately continuing recording for, uh, for a new release. I don't know if that will be later this year. It might be. And then of course, doing everything that I can to get out and play live shows here, there and everywhere. I think we may do a few things in Canada and we're going to try and finally get back over to Europe. It's been about three years since we've been back there. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. I just, just sort of had to clean the slate there and, um, you know, just take care of, uh, just take care of a few things that needed to be taken care of, let's say. And, um, so I'm really, really grateful to have the opportunity to go back and, uh, yeah, so I think just just ultimately hoping to stay busy. Philip, this has been great. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. I know you're busy, and I, I really appreciate it. Wow, come on, Marco. This is actually, i got to tell you, I really, really enjoyed this conversation. I mean, you, you know your stuff, and the, the artists that you're speaking with are just serious. I mean, it's how how great to be, you know, shine a light on David Grissom and Ian Moore and these kind of, these kind of artists. I mean, these are guys, for me, just telling you personally, these are guys that, I'm very much inspired by and look up to. So it's, uh, I feel honored to to chat with you about this. And, uh, yeah, it's the main thing. I hope that I was getting it through is just to, just to hold on to that authenticity. That's what I'm doing the best that I can to hold on to the initial spark and love of music. Thank you for listening. If you enjoy this episode, it would mean a lot to me if you can take a moment to visit iTunes and rate this podcast until next time.